Hello, I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and welcome back to Beauty and the Bacteria, an exploration into the world of the skin microbiome. In this series, we're taking a closer look at the entangled nature of our skin's relationship to the microbes that live on and in the skin, and how that affects our lives from birth till death. This is part two of our episode titled Microbiome 101. In the last part, we took a crash course into microbiology, where we looked at the discovery of microbiology as a science, the invention of the microscope, which has allowed us to see microbes, the creation of taxonomy, and the ways by which we characterize bacteria. In part two, we'll be taking this information and discussing how the technical nature of microbiology has led us to a better understanding of the interconnection between the human body and the microbes that call it home. Just like last time, this is going to be quite a bit of great information, but a bit technical in nature. So don't be afraid to pause the video, take a breather, and come back to it when you're ready to continue so that you can most effectively immerse yourselves in the information. So once again, grab your coffee and your notebook if you want to keep notes, and let's dive in. So, as we discussed in episode one, the medical literature is booming with more and more reports of research on the microbiome of everything, from humans to pets to cesspools. When we look at the market as a whole, there are hundreds of products on the market already that are targeted to modulating the microbiome. You've heard of terms like probiotics, microbiome-friendly, antibacterial. These all describe how some products interact with your body's microbiome. So why all the interest? And why such an increase in interest all of a sudden? Well, if it was a war between us and them, if we go by numbers alone, we are heavily outmatched. Just in cell numbers, we are underrepresented 10 to 1. And in numbers of genes, we lose by 500 to 1. But luckily we are finding more and more that it isn't a war, but an attempt to be in balance, in symbiosis between our bodies, and the microbiota that live within it. So, to better understand the connection of the science of microbiology and how it is directly associated to our health, let's start with the gut microbiome, as it's pretty remarkable, and after many years of yogurt and probiotic commercials, it's the part of the human microbiome that many people are familiar with the most. The human gut has a vast variety of bacteria, fungi, archaea, and viruses that are all the community of the microbes that make up the gut microbiota. This community is comprised of 100 million organisms with a density in the colon estimated at 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 12th bacteria cells per milliliter. That's roughly the same number of bacteria in a milliliter of stool as there are stars in the entire Milky Way. When one investigates the gut, one might be amazed about two and a half pounds of a 150 pound person is made up from the microbiota. Then it should not be all that surprising that we are now finding how large a part these microbes play in both the disease and in keeping people healthy. Dysbiosis in the gut microbiome has been associated with obesity, type two diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, liver disease, cancers of the colon and the liver, and a neuronal condition such as age-related macular degeneration, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's diseases. This sounds scary, and it can be, if the balance between the human cells and our microbiome cells are out of whack. So what is the balance here? What constitutes a healthy microbiome? Interestingly, like fingerprints, there is a considerable variability from microbiome of one person to the next. And there is no standard microbiome recipe for a healthy gut or healthy skin microbiome. It even changes as we age. Babies born by cesarean section have a different microbiome compared to those having gone through vaginal births, just as babies have different varieties of microbes than adults. There are variables early in life, such as gestation period, type of delivery, bottle formula or breastfeeding, and weaning. All that can shape each person's microbiota. As one becomes an adult, 
Differences between microbiota differ due to body mass index, exercise, lifestyle, and cultural habits. However, it is generally recognized that the gut microbiome is primarily made up of bacteroidetes and the Firmicutes family of bacteria in a normal, healthy gut microbiome, typically making up of about 90% of all of the bacteria there. When an out of balance uh, microbiome exists, this can shift to foster more pathogenic bacteria such as proteobacteria like E. coli and salmonella like S. enterica, which can cause severe food poisoning or even death. When considering how to define and maintain a balanced or healthy microbiome, another factor to consider is how use of antibiotics can affect the microbiota composition. Certain antibiotics may have more or less of an impact on different species, leading to an abundance or growth of one species and the disappearance of others, setting up an imbalance or dysbiosis. This can lead to the advent of opportunistic infections like MRSA on the skin or C. difficile in the gut. Additionally, there is that little thing about creating antibiotic resistance strains, which makes antibiotics less useful and bacteria more dangerous. Just as there is a complex interaction between the gut microbiome and the host, the same is true with the skin microbiome. As skin is the largest organ in the human body and provides protection from the environment that is riddled with pollution, particles, and microbes of all types, it is crucial to be able to function properly. As we've discussed, it is inevitable that every surface of our body will be exposed to the environment and will also be riddled with microbes. Part of our defense is being able to determine which microbes are okay and which ones are not. However, not all microbes can grow on all parts of the skin. Unlike the gut, the surface of the skin is fairly dry. However, the skin does retain hundreds of microorganism species, and although not as dense a population as the gut, they still are estimated to be at about 10 to the fifth microbes per square centimeter of skin. Just as in different areas of the gut, there are different communities of microbiota, the same is true for the skin, as referenced in this quote by Albert Kligman from 1965. The dissimilarities of different regions of skin are truly profound and are necessarily reflected in the density and diversity of the organisms which inhabit them. The axilla is a tropical rainforest with its ample supplies of sweat and hair. The perineum, a veritable swamp draining the cesspool of the anus. A deep, dank, humid cave like the external ear canal is a sanctuary for bacterial growth. The scalp is a thick woods seeping with sebum. There are the oily tundras of the face, the comparative deserts of the trunk, and the moist recesses of the intertriginous regions. The skin, while protective in design, is not an impenetrable barrier and allows interaction between the outside environment and the internal systems. This allows it to adapt to stressors and conditions that would ultimately be harmful or deadly to the entire organism. Although the skin does have many functions that allow it to be the outward defense to the environment, we are finding that many of the microorganisms that reside in and on the skin also provide vital functions which the human body does not possess the ability to perform. It relies upon the symbiotic interaction of microorganisms to help protect the body. For example, skin microbes have an interaction in developing the immune system by educating the many T cells that are found in the skin to recognize pathogenic microorganisms and to regulate defense mechanisms, such as production of antimicrobial peptides. Staphylococcus aureus, a known pathogen when grown unchecked, is controlled by Staph epidermidis and Staph hominis by producing their own antimicrobial peptides. Further, in healthy skin, the pH is kept typically low by the formation of propionic acid by Cutobacterium acnes, formerly known as Propionobacterium acnes or P. acnes, which metabolizes sebum from the skin and turns it into the acid, thus controlling the growth of the alkali-secreting Staph aureus, which needs high pH to thrive. 
This is illustrated by the increase in Staph aureus infection rates that can be observed after isotretinoin therapy. Isotretinoin therapy, which shuts down sebum production necessary for C. acnes to metabolize into propionic acid, and results in the raising of the skin surface pH and better living conditions for pathogens such as Staph aureus. To that point, many common skin disorders are associated with an underlying local imbalance of the skin microbiota. These include acne, athlete's foot, eczema, psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis, as well as infections. There is recent evidence that several bacteria and fungi may contribute to non-melanoma skin cancers, while others may protect against those very cancers. I've observed this type of phenomenon myself within my own lab's research, where we observed that a common skin bacteria species was associated with regulation of genes associated with skin cancers. In addition, it is now being proposed that skin problems may be initiated by disturbing the skin microbiota balance. The abundant use of topical skin products can provide food and support to the skin microbiota, but can also introduce pH modulators, preservatives, and other antimicrobial ingredients which can influence the microbial balance. Products used to clean the skin and hair, such as shampoos and body washes, can also remove food sources that are the favorites of selective organisms. Even showering and bathing with just water has shown to transiently raise the skin surface pH, influencing microbial growth. As one ages, there are fewer skin cells being produced, skin barrier is lessened, sebum production falls, all leading to less food for some microbes, lessening the beneficial diversity in the microbiota and changing the microbe community. With the current emergence of COVID-19, we have seen a large rise in the use of disinfectants, extended cleansing by hand washing, and protection of viral transfer by mask wearing, all having an influence in potentially changing the previous microbiome environment. One can only wonder what changes to the microbiome will occur with these changes in habits and practices in everyday life dictated by the pandemic, and what outcomes, beneficial or detrimental, they may have on the skin. And that, my friends, concludes Microbiome 101. Yay! We covered the discovery of microbiology as a science, the invention of the microscope, which allowed us to see the microbes, the creation of taxonomy, the ways by which we characterize bacteria, and what this all means for the human body. Each episode after the series airs, I'll be spending some time on social media answering questions from you, the viewers. So please send your questions, comments, and topics you'd like us to cover to comments at beautyandthebacteria.com. You can also follow us on social media listed here to watch our Q&A sessions, interviews, or to send us your questions and to receive updates on this series, as well as other news and information on skin microbiome initiatives at Crown. From all of us here at Crown Laboratories, thank you for watching. And remember, you have billions of bacteria on your face, and we think that's awesome. Goodbye for now.